Yes. Not a tab. The tab would go to Chrome tab. So you have to say uh, share a window. Share a window. Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, got it. Okay. Hey, hey Vidisha, thank you so much uh, for being here. I thought you had slipped away. Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, no such luck. <laughs> no such luck. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, but you're going to listen to things that you've already heard. So, um, but in any case, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here. So, okay, let me start um, by saying, I, you know, without any further ado, saying uh, thank you mu much for uh, having me. Uh, and now let me get going. Um, so you can see my pointer. Can you see the pointer? Not yet. Not yet? Oh. Maybe, maybe. you have to go full screen. Are you full screen? I'm full screen. You don't see full screen? You see my slides moving? Yes, yes, it's it's fine now. Okay, and you see the. Yeah, I can see. We can see your pointer too. Okay, perfect, perfect. All right, so good. So what I'm going to tell you about is what we think about the cell membrane uh, from you know from a perspective that I I should argue has been obtained uh, almost from purely by physical terms. So. Um, the work that I'm going to talk to you about, and I hope to end with, is an appreciation that the membrane of a living cell is, uh, <clears throat> is a very exciting place. It's an active actin membrane composite. And the team that has been working on this for years now uh, is uh, something with uh, my close colleague uh, and Madan um, and I uh, sort of began many years ago. Rather, Madan sort of joined the effort when uh, we started working on this uh, perhaps uh, now 25 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we've had groups that focus on theory. There is uh, Sarsij, whose name is not mentioned here, Kripa Anirban, who have been working on theoretical part of this work. Uh, there, is, there are people who worked in vitro, uh, work in vitro, Darius, Kabir, Abrar, and Sankarshan. And there are people who have worked in the cell, Ambika, Ria, Subrajit, and my other colleagues here on the right, uh, Parijat, Chandrima, Thomas, in particular, uh, <laughs> and the rest, and Snigdev now. Uh, and if you notice, a number of them happen to be from uh, eastern part of this country. Uh, anyway, now I, I guess uh, there may be a particular uh, reason for that, because a number of people from uh, Calcutta in particular are quite obsessed with biophysics, and I'm so glad that is the case. Um, we also have another side of the lab that works on endocytosis, which I'm not going to be talking about now, although endocytosis occurs at the cell surface and is carried out by some of the very molecules that uh, Dhruba uh, just uh, indicated to us in her talk. Uh, all right, so the reason we look at the cell membrane is because, you know, the membrane, I think, is something that captures information from the outside, translates it to the cell, and allows a cell to perform many tasks. I mean, the reason I'm speaking to you is because the membrane actually engages with neurotransmitters. Uh, the neutrophil in, in view in question here is uh, going after a bacterium. And therefore, you know, in, in, uh, we all are uh, sitting here without suffering septic shocks, at, uh, septic shock all the time, because the neutrophil is actually able to find the bacterium and eat it. Uh, the reason it finds the bacterium and eat and eat it is because the membrane itself is capable of interrogating the outside, both its chemical and physical environment, and translating that into information on the inside. Um, that information on the inside is uh, modulated fundamentally by the plasma membrane of a, of a living cell. Uh, and the plasma membrane, of, and, and we have, as I said, for a number of years, tried to work uh, on uh, the rules and principles governing local regulated organization. Uh, we would try to understand the physics, chemistry, and the genetics behind this organization. Uh, and in particular, uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is about the, how the local organization of the membrane is put together and potentially controlled. And this work, as I said, is a very close collaboration with Madan. Now, uh, before I tell you about the membrane, I should tell you something about uh, membrane structure and how we have come to appreciate the structure of the membrane as a bilayer. Uh, because as I gather, there are a number of students also in the audience. And, um, and you know, if the 
uh, more senior amongst uh, the individuals uh, uh, with little more gray hair than the students beg, uh, you know, can be, uh, can excuse me, I'm going to take a little bit of time and just give you a perspective on how we've arrived at this picture of a membrane bilayer. The picture that we have of a membrane bilayer most commonly is that of the Singer-Nicholson, the Singer-Nicholson model. Uh, the Singer-Nicholson model is uh, something that uh, is really uh, driven our understanding of the membrane for, well, I would say now at least for 50 years. Uh, but this model has a number of shortcomings. Uh, it has a, it appeared as a culmination of over a over a hundred years of work, beginning with Agnes Pockles uh, in the eighties, in the nine in the eighteen eighties to Langmuir, uh, to Gotter and Grendel for actually unraveling the fact that the lipid membrane of a cell was a bilayer, and the reason they did that was because they actually looked at a very special cell, the erythrocyte. Had they looked at a fibroblast, they would have come up with a very different picture. But they looked at an erythrocyte, and and for the students, I, I put that as a question: Why did they? Why did that happen? There were other models, so trilamellar models. Um, but then, you know, because of a number of observations from the diffusion of molecules, from the capacity of membranes to fuse, uh, the membrane of a living cell was posited as a, lip, a fluid mosaic model. Uh, which incorporated all the observations of membrane protein diffusion. Uh, then, you know, of course, since it's a bilayer, chemists and physical chemists have been working on membrane bilayers for years and looking at multi-component systems, which naturally have a tendency to phase segregate. So the idea that membranes and lipids, uh, lipids and living membranes could phase separate also began to be in injected into the uh, into the imagination of uh, people looking at cell membranes in general. And uh, colleagues such as uh, uh, Gerrit van Meer, uh, Kai Siemens, uh, and uh, others uh, uh, began to now propose that the membrane of living cells was not just a fluid membrane in which lipids were well mixed, but they were in fact uh, capable of phase segregation. And this phase segregation was a functional uh, or was a functional significance, uh, and that would be you know important to important to appreciate because a lot of different functions were applied to these so-called raft phases of cell membranes, where lipids were thought to form distinct phase segregated patches, con concentrated in cholesterol and sphingolipids, uh, for what, what have you. But the point I want to make uh, from this observation is that, that you know, what I've told you now reveals a very intertwined relationship between concepts borrowed from physical studies on artificial membranes with experiments on cell membranes. And the timeline of such a synthesis that uh, occurred uh, it was about 100 years for Singer-Nicholson. And Singer-Nicholson to now uh, has been sort of peppered with these interjections of, uh, again, I would say, a similar philosophy that the membrane is a is a well mixed system and well mixed systems if they are multi component can exhibit uh, properties that are that produce these uh, mosaic like patterns in the membrane. And I'll just paraphrase something from uh, Mike Edidin, who wrote this very nice review in 2003, where he says we are now awaiting a new model in 2003. He says that our integ integrates the number of features of eukaryotic cell membranes which have emerged ever since they were first characterized. And, and I'm going to tell you about what this new model is about today. Um, so if you look at uh, a piece of a patch of membrane, take Singer-Nicholson fluid mosaic, and, but, and take this patch of membrane from a living cell uh, and extract that lipid and make a bleb, a cell detached bleb. And if you look at the bleb at 37 degrees, it's, it's a very uniform uh, lipid mixture. Uh, but if you cool it down, say to 20 degrees, at which temperature the cell is almost choking, uh, the membrane begins to uh, exhibit large-scale phase segregation. And these segregated patches are, uh, are like the liquid ordered patches that one would see uh, when, you when you have separation of lipids of two different properties, for example, uh, you know, disordered and ordered phases, and ordered phases now begin to separate. And if in this patch now one puts in a marker, which is a, like a GPI anchored protein, which is a protein that we've used 
to explore the properties of the cell membrane. If you put in a GPI anchor, look at a GPI anchor protein in this living cell membrane, which is made into a bleb, uh, that, live, that GPI anchor protein now, when it is, it is uniform in the, at 37 degrees, but it actually partitions into the raft-like phase when you cool it down. So we asked the question to the cell itself, what happens to, if you look at the structure and organization of the GPI anchored molecule in a living system? And, and for that, we put a bunch of binoculars on the uh, GPI anchored protein itself. Uh, we put uh, fluorescent tags on the GPI anchored protein and uh, using a method that we developed years ago uh, called um, uh, FRET imaging, we were able to uh, uh, determine uh, the nearest neighbors of other GPI anchor proteins. So this method is a fairly straightforward method. You excite the fluorophore with polarized light right here. And once you excite the fluorophore with polarized light, you monitor the fluorescence uh, in two orientations, one along the angle of pol uh, along the axis of excitation and the other uh, orthogonal to that axis. And when you do that, if molecules are close by, and close enough for energy transfer to take place, they will transfer their energy to near neighboring fluorophores who may be of a slightly different orientation. And therefore, they will exhibit a much more depolarized fluorescence uh, from, from that ensemble of, of molecules. So just by monitoring the loss of polarization, you're able to monitor the presence of the nearest neighbors of GPI anchored, or fluorescent molecules, any fluorescent molecule, if you will, as long as the fluorophore is not tumbling faster than the lifetime of the, of the fluorophore itself. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so this is very easy to set up and one can set this up in, uh, in, a, in a total internal reflection mode or in a wide field mode or in a confocal mode or in a, you know, in any kind of a multi uh, sort of current uh, uh, confocal or imaging system where all you need to do is uh, ensure that the excitation of the fluorophore takes place in a polarized manner and the emission is collected in two orientations, the parallel and perpendicular. And what you see is, is and this is uh, that if molecules are close by, we will see in most of my slides if, uh, where I show data, you will see uh, blue uh, regions where blue regions reflect low fluorescence and isotropy, where the molecules are exhibiting high fret and uh, orange or red regions where the molecules are well spaced and therefore exhibiting uh, high anisotropy and, and corresponding low fret. Okay, so if you look at a patch of a cell, living cell membrane with such a method, what you see in that patch are regions uh, where the intensity is relatively uniform, but the fluorescence and isotropy of incredible variation. Deep blue patches and orange patches. These deep blue patches, by the way, are what we determined now many years ago with uh, working with also with Madan to model some of these uh, data that we had uh, obtained upon perturbing the, uh, per the fluorescence uh, intensity itself. Uh, details I'm not going to go into here. Uh, we'd found that there were tiny clusters of these GPI anchor proteins present in these concentrated little blue patches. And in these regions, we had, in these regions next door, we had monomers. Uh, this data was sort of, at that time, quite incredulous to us, and I'll tell you why. But uh, it was also corroborated by many other methods subsequently by electron microscopy, by near field optical scanning microscopy, and more recently by, uh, by the new super resolution tools that have emerged from the uh, uh, labs of a number of people, including, uh, including um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, the uh, Janelia person, uh, Eric. So, uh, but the picture that emerges from such uh, data uh, is that the the structures that we are picking up, these highly spatially heterogeneous patches of regions which are enriched in clusters and depleted of clusters. Of uh, Another fact that emerges is that this cluster is highly cholesterol sensitive and it is actively remodeling, but most importantly, immobile in location. Uh, the cluster is immobile in location and concentration independent. Now, these properties that I described to you here have all been obtained by very detailed biophysical measurements of the kinetics and dynamics of the clustering phenomena of these GPI anchor proteins uh, in the membranes of living cells. So we've 
used, for example, a confocal volume as an observation volume or like a cuet to determine these different properties. And I'm not, again, uh, published over the years. So again, I will you know, just simply summarize the data here. Um, but the, a, a, a striking feature of, this, of these clusters were actually obtained when we looked at the membrane with this FRET method, the membrane of these, of these blebs. So when the cell forms blebs, uh, and you can make any cell form a bleb if you simply uh, allow the cell, detach the cell from a surface and put it down on a surface to which it cannot uh, actually form adhesions, the cells make these blebs. And when these blebs puff out, the clusters actually completely disappear. Uh, and, uh, and, that, and the blebs themselves have this peculiar property that they lack the cortical actin cytoskeleton. Um, we then perturbed the cortical actin cytoskeleton and we determined that the blebs, uh, that the membrane, uh, only when it is in contact with the cortical actin cytoskeleton, uh, are these clusters in some sense expressed. When I say expressed, I mean they are generated. And uh, based on the other observations that they are spatially heterogeneous, concentration independent, immobile, and have uh, cholesterol sensitive, uh, we came to the conclusion that the clustering of these molecules are actively maintained. Now, now remember that you have a GPI anchored protein, which is a protein that is anchored to a, uh, a phospholipid, a glycophospholipid, sitting on the outer leaflet uh, who, that is clustered. And that clustering is actively maintained, meaning it is sensing something of, in the cytoplasm or, or in the cytoskeleton. And, um, and so the, you know, at this point, uh, we sort of uh, needed to rack our brains and ask what's, what's going on. And uh, again, uh, around this time in about 2006 and to four to eight or what have you, uh, Aki Kusumi um, uh, in Japan and his group were showing that the membrane of living cells is fundamentally impacted by its, uh, uh, at least the properties of diffusion of molecules in the membrane of living cells is fundamentally impacted by their ability to uh, engage with the cortical actin cytoskeleton. And the cortical actin cytoskeleton, you know, forms these sort of beautiful meshwork-like architecture that imprints itself on the membrane. And the membrane lipids then uh, are uh, now sensing this, uh, this meshwork and their, their diffusion is impacted. Uh, so this was sort of a, a knowledge that was beginning, uh, but we realized that this was not sufficient to explain the dynamics of the clustering process that we were seeing, nor its activity, because what we would have seen here would have, was, would have been a passive imprint. Um, and at this stage, uh, Kripa and Madan sort of began looking at this data with some uh, you know, uh, interest. And uh, being the physicists that they were, they, they threw away all prior knowledge of biology and said, now, how do we um, you know, explain this phenomena from, from pure thought? And Madan, of course, was working on, uh, uh, on the active hydrodynamics of, uh, of polar filaments and of membrane molecules and how they're impacted by that. And, uh, and Kripa uh, you know, came up with this idea that perhaps in uh, enmeshed in this sort of meshwork of the actin cortex are these filaments of uh, filaments of of actin whoops sorry this should have gone uh, this is an animation that's not working but never mind uh, the are these filaments of actin uh, which are in, shown in red here comp, uh, interacting with these myosin motors and then they form these little foci and form these little clusters and so they argued that there's a contractile actin composite which templates the membrane. And the composite uh, is sandwiched between the act cortical actin mesh and the plasma membrane. Um, so they proposed that, uh, in fact, a purely theoretical framework, that there were two sorts of actins, one short dynamic filaments and a static mesh, motor activity, and, with, and that gives the properties of treadmilling, alignment, advection, and a contractile stress that creates sort of dynamic asters of these polar filaments, which in turn end up uh, templating, if you will, the, the, the molecules in the membrane that interact with this actin. Of course, uh, Kripa and Madan didn't worry the fact about the fact that the actin was in the inner leaflet, the GPI is on the other outer leaflet. All that was uh, things that you know, mere, mere uh, mortals like us had to deal with. Uh, um, and, but they argued 
and I think this was the most exciting thing, that if all you needed was myosin motors that had this sort of a property and small actin filaments and a lipid layer with actin and tractin components, and now the system is ready to go. And we would see, we would see precisely what we were seeing in the membrane, which are these clusters of actin, uh, of actomyosin forming these uh, patches driving the clusters of these GPI proteins. So we said, well, if this is the case, we should be able to reconstitute the system. And we reconstitute, oh, okay. The first thing we said, do we see such filaments in the uh, small filaments in the membrane? And Thomas at this stage was, had just joined the lab and he found using fluorescence correlation spectroscopy, if you by tagging uh, a actin binding molecule with a fluorescent tag, uh, actin filament binding molecule with a fluorescent tag, that there were small filaments of actin uh, which, which exhibited uh, uh, correlation times that were consistent with being 100 to 150 nanometers in size, and that these filaments uh, are there in every cell and very close to the membrane. And this was something that we hadn't seen before, and you know, we of course got very excited by, and uh, this prompted us to go to the next step, which was to reconstitute this system. And uh, so here, um, Darius Costa, who is, a, who is also a, a colleague uh, of Bidisha's, uh, when they were in the same lab in, in Paris many years ago, Darius, <coughs> uh, in fact, uh, worked with uh, um, uh, worked with us to set up a, a supported lipid bilayer system, uh, where he had lipids uh, that were ha had a nickel and TA tag on it, and the nickel and TA tag recruited his tag, uh, ezrin, uh, uh, the C terminal tail of ezrin, which is a protein that binds actin. So now you had a his tag molecule with an ezrin on one side. And now when that molecule was put on the bilayer, it, it acted like a carpet that could recruit actin filaments to it. And now when we recruited actin filaments to it, uh, we, we could then add to this, to this system, the myosin motor and add some ATP and look at what happens. So that's what, what you're seeing here. You're seeing that in the absence of ATP, just before it uh, starts, the actin is diffused the, the lipid molecule that's, a, that's associated with the actin is diffused. And now when you add myosin motor, you build this cluster and this cluster now forms the, uh, uh, the, uh, an aster driven activity that leads to the concentration of these molecules. So this recapitulated, if you will, the, the, the theoretical expectations that were laid down by theory in ample measure. And you can read about that in a paper that Darius uh, and us published uh, Know, several years ago now. Um, okay, so the implications of this are that if there are uh, um, this dynamic actin machinery at the inner leaflet of a cell, if you look, if you take the cell, mem a membrane protein in the cell, and attach the same actin binding protein to that membrane protein, uh, which we had in vitro, attach it to a, any garden variety membrane protein which had nothing to do with actin that membrane protein would exhibit the clusters that we see of GPI anchored proteins. And indeed, that's exactly what we saw, that, the, that if you see these really deep blue patches, they are patches where the clusters are highly concentrated. And we see the same sort of spatially heterogeneous uh, uh, you know, variegation that we observed with the GPI anchored proteins as well. And when we got rid of the uh, actin binding capacity of this actin domain as a control, that entire uh, that entire actin clustering, dependent clustering machinery disappeared. Okay, so, so this is great. You had an actin binding protein, we had an actin uh, binding capacity in the cytoplasm that itself was able to now uh, build this structure. So what is going on here? Um, uh, we also realized, and Parijat uh, uh, published a lovely paper recently where she showed that uh, a physiologically relevant uh, protein like CD44, which actually recruits ezrin uh, as one of its actin binding components, uh, now also forms clusters of similar kind in the membrane of living cells. And those are a functional consequence. If you get rid of that ezrin domain and prevent this clustering, uh, the CD44's activities sort of fall apart. Um, Ruma found that uh, ecoderin one of the most important molecules involved in keeping cells together, again exhibits properties like this, and that property is used to tune 
cell cell junctions because it is now sensitive to the actin cytoskeleton. All this is very fine and well for, uh, for transmembrane proteins, but the GPI anchor protein that we started our work with uh, is an enigma, right? I mean, it is sitting on the outer leaflet. How is it connecting to stuff on the inner side? And so this is where um, Ambika and Ria began to uh, work with Ram Vishwakarma's group. And we said, there must be something in the lipid, uh, lipids that the GPI anchor proteins have, uh, which allows it to link across the bilayer with this inner, inner leaflet. And uh, what they did was they made a series of GPI anchor analogs. And we found that the analog that had just long saturated acylon chains was sufficient to confer the capacity to make these clusters of the inner leaflet. No, cl clusters of the molecule that have been introduced at the outer leaflet. We found that there must be a trans bilayer connection with a lipid of the inner leaflet. And that uh, trans bilayer connection would have to be sensitive to cholesterol. And indeed, the lipid that we found that, that fit that bill was phosphatidylserine. If you took cells that could not make phosphatidylserine, uh, the GPI clusters of the outer leaflet disappeared. But the cluster of the transmembrane proteins were perfectly fine. And again, if we, we added back um, non hydrolyzable analogs of the phosphatidylserine, which long saturated acyl chains, we could recapitulate the clustering of the GPI anchor proteins. And again, you can read about this work. Uh, in in uh, in work that has been published, uh, you know, now more than six years ago. Okay, so so this is uh, uh, very exciting. But and and what does this uh, tell us? So now here we resorted to some uh, simulations of the kind that you've heard. These are somewhat coarse grain simulations of the kind that you've heard uh, from Druba uh, a little while ago, uh, where. Um, where we, where we prepared asymmetric membrane bilayers. And I do agree with Dhruba that this was a real task and Madan and Anirban struggled to ensure that the mechanical stability of the system was maintained. Uh, and they found that if you put uh, DOPC, sphingomyelin and cholesterol and GPIs on the outer leaflet and long saturated acyl chain containing uh, lipids at the inner leaflet like PS with PS, cholesterol and phosphatidylethanolamine at the inner leaflet, the membranes themselves were nice and well mixed. Nothing happened. But moment, and this is at 37 degrees. These, these bilayers, by the way, are capable of phase segregating when you lower the temperature to 20 degrees. But at 37 degrees, they're well mixed. But at 37 degrees, if we now immobilize the PS at the inner leaflet, the GPI anchor proteins come for the ride and they form uh, and they form these tight clusters where the PS is localized. So um, I won't go through some of the detail there, but just to give you a, a representation of what's going on, we believe that actin interacts with an, a linker at the inner leaflet, which links up to these phosphatidylserine uh, containing lipids uh, and is driven by myosins that then, that then trap and hold the, machine, the, uh, the lipids in one place bringing the GPI to proteins on the other place. But because we had done simulations, we also noticed one thing, that these regions were highly uh, ordered where the bilayers came in, came in contact with each other. The outer and the inner leaflet came in contact with each other. And they formed little local nano ordered domains. So, and of course, this is happening at temperatures at which the membrane itself is homogeneous and well mixed. So clearly, the input of energy from myosin motors and from uh, actin is capable, if they are able to hold these lipids there, it's capable of creating a new lipid environment for the, for the membrane. And so we argued that if this is the case, uh, then the patches of GPI anchor proteins or patches where GPI anchor proteins are enriched must correspond to uh, ordered domains at high temperature where they should not normally be forming. And to probe that, we now um, went to again use another biophysical uh, uh, probe, uh, which is uh, a probe that tells us something about solvent penetration into bilayers. And the, um, the probe that we use was a probe called Lordan, which when it's present in ordered domains is uh, gives us a more of a, uh, of a blue shifted uh, uh, fluorescence. And if it is present in disordered domains, it gives us more of a red shifted domain. And this method was actually pioneered by a close uh, uh, 
uh, friend and colleague who I'm uh, sorry to sorry to say who just departed. She uh, struggled with cancer for many years, and uh, Catherine Katrina Gauss just passed away about a month ago. And you know, uh, I really uh, uh, you know want, want to express deep uh, sorrow, but also uh, pride and privilege of having worked with some somebody who's been so inspirational in many many of the biophysical measurements that we made in cells. Um, so uh, anyway, so. So what we found and what Subhajit found is that if we now took our membrane, which had GPI anchored proteins in it, and outlined the patches where GPI anchored clusters are present, and mapped those to regions where we were monitoring the uh, monitoring the, uh, uh, the the fluorescence uh, ratio of the blue versus red fluorescence of the GP, as it's called, the generalized polarization of the of the Lordan, uh, we find that regions that are rich in GPI clusters are also uh, have a much higher local lipid order. And regions that are poor have a poor lower lipid order. And regions that have transmembrane anchored proteins, in fact, don't care about what the local lipid environment is. So, um, so what I've told you is that the heterogeneity in membranes uh, at, in the living state is arising as a consequence of this active consumption of energy at the inner leaflet and driving these patterns of molecules in the inner leaflet. So for example, the GPI anchor proteins driven through this elaborate machinery of transbilayer interactions, uh, you know, in conjunction with PS is driven to build these uh, ordered domains in the membrane. Transmembrane pr proteins, on the other hand, can go anywhere they like. If transmembrane proteins, by the way, have a preference for ordered domains, they would also generate ordered domains in those, in those regions. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm getting close to the end of my seminar. Uh, and um, because I'm going to stop here and then we take some questions, I hope, uh, where we're saying that the cell surface is uh, a membrane actin cortex, which has three classes of molecules with respect to dynamic actin. And those uh, molecules that do not interact with this, with any of these machineries at the present of the inner leaflet are in fact going to reflect very well the Singer-Nicholson model of an uh, equilibrium membrane where membrane properties are dictated by the properties of this membrane of, of the lipids and their constituents at equilibrium. But then we have these uh, very uh, uh, energy powered uh, configurations uh, like the nano clusters that I've talked to you about. Those are dominantly patterning the membrane in the living state where, where in the living state being a state where energy is being consumed all the time. And those are giving rise to these very special uh, protein and lipid environments, which are governed by the active consumption of energy. And finally, because it is capable of being patterned by energy, we argue there are regulators. And these regulators are key. And now we know we've discovered a whole zoo of these regulators, uh, where, uh, for example, in, uh, these are membrane receptors, if you will. Not, I mean, that's another, uh, it's another term for them that we are saying that there are these active regulators, which turn out to be nothing but membrane receptors that are sensing both the uh, uh, physical and chemical environment of the outside world. The integrin receptor is a fabulous example of such a, of such a uh, active regulator, which senses information from the outside and translates that into the activity uh, of, <clears throat> of the integrin receptors, if you will, on the inside through these, uh, through these effectors. And these effectors in turn generate the actin and the actin and the myosin machinery that is necessary to keep the membrane in these uh, dynamically configured states. As we realize now, uh, not only the integral receptor, which we have, and we have now recently shown, behaves exactly in this manner, but many other receptors also function in this manner to control the local lipid environment. So, um, so I think this is the means by which the membrane is actually coming alive. The membrane actually is an information transducing system which connects to the cortical actin and is powered by the cortical actin, uh, the energy that's consumed in this actin that's near it. There will be other systems as well, microtubules, most likely uh, other uh, energy consuming systems that, that impart, uh, impart characteristics to the membrane. There are molecules that are going to change the, uh, in fact, the the chemical composition, for example, fossil inositides of various stripes that will create uh, patches of defined composition that will also generate uh, various structures that will have special properties. So the membrane is not a single Nicholson 
fluid uh, equilibrium system. It is, in fact, this highly adaptive sensorium. It's an energy-consuming skin that drapes the cell, and it is exquisitely mechanochemically regulated. And I think the properties that I've just described about just one property distinction, liquid order versus liquid disorder, uh, as we, as, as we uh, um, you know, uh, discussed in the previous talk of Dribbles, that that has the capacity to influence the proteins in the membrane itself and therefore affect function. So I think what we are seeing in the, in the cell membrane is that it is, a, it is a fabric which is entirely orchestrated by signaling input and that orchestration is self-organized, this organizing principles I've just mentioned to you, and the consequences of that are many. And I, and I haven't touched upon them, but we have explored many of these consequences on both self-fate, self-migration, cell signaling and membrane protein organization. So with that, I'm going to end and thank uh, the people who worked on this. We, uh, I, I have spoken of the work of Parijat, Ruma, Abrar, Chandrima, Rajat, Pranav, Samir, Samira, Demanjan, Ria, Subhashri, Subhrajit, Darius, and Ambika. This has really been a collaborative effort of really no mean, no mean uh, 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 teams with Madan uh, playing, Madan and his group playing an amazingly uh, uh, part, you know, an amazing partnership over the years. Our uh, amazing team from the uh, imaging facility at NCBS and our head of facilities, Krishnamurti Manoj, over the years, and Feroz have been very helpful in helping us ensure that we have systems to make observations, quantitative observations. And I must say the reconstitution was done in this sort of idyllic place, the um, uh, Woods Hole, by uh, collaborations with Dyke Mullins and uh, Dari, when Darius came and worked with me uh, at Woods Hole and uh, actually did some pipetting to generate the first living artificial bilayers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful talk. Now uh, we take some questions. So Srinivas asked, uh, does spatial orientation and stiffness of ECM matrix on which this cell rests also affect the clustering, especially when cancer cell starts migrating? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that question again? Um, I missed it. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, does spatial orientation and stiffness of ECM matrix on which these cells rest also affect clustering? Oh, and I, another. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Another word is uh, especially when cancer cells start migrating. Right. Very interesting point. Uh, the ECM itself, its stiffness as well as its chemical composition, uh, govern and drive the changes that we see in the membrane. And that in turn, is able to modulate the capacity of cells to migrate or not. So for example, if you have a soft uh, substrate with a ECM uh, that is able to tickle the cell, the, the cell itself is not able to generate a migratory potential. I mean, this is, I'm talking about a fibroblast now uh, because it is not able to build these membrane nano domains which create, uh, which create these uh, environments for movement which create the environment for up to three activation. But if you have a stiff substrate and you have the right ligands, now the cell is perfectly poised to use that. And in fact, it uses this nano domains to build the architecture for its movement. Yeah. Oh, thank you, sir. So next question is from Deepto Tonu. He asked, uh, can GPI AP nanoclustering also potentiate downstream signaling activation of different pathways via receptor clustering? No, um, very good question. Um, so, so what we note, uh, at least in one instance, is that the G is that uh, well more than one instance that the GPI anchored protein clusters themselves are platforms where other rho GTPases such as RAC uh, can be recruited. And that RAC recruitment leads to a, a uh, uh, activation of the downstream players below RAC. In, interestingly, if you generate these clusters, the, the membrane also becomes much more permissive to RAS activation, simply because certain forms of RAS, like HRAS, are also permethylated, and they, they now find themselves in permethylated patches of the membrane where they can be or where they can engage with specific types of effectors. 
So we think by tuning these, the, the availability of these GPI linked nano clusters, you can tune the properties of membranes in different ways. And I think signaling receptors communicate with each other based on, based on what is produced in the membrane. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, sir. So the next question is from Shikha Prakash. She asked, can you discuss a little bit about the transient behavior of actin binding proteins with PIP2 lipids? Uh, right. So, um, yeah, so I mean, I'll give you what is known, for example, about a protein like uh, Ezrin. The full length Ezrin protein uh, has a PIP binding domain. Uh, which is secluded, uh, or or it is sort of um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, it is sort of auto inhibited when uh, by its C terminal domain, uh, which is the actin binding domain. So now, if there are pips present in the membrane, the ezrin itself is recruited to the membrane, and the pip binding domain is opened up and the actin binding domain gets exposed and allowing the protein now to interact laterally with other membrane proteins so that it can it can now confer actin binding capacity on those proteins i mean it's, it's an elaborate system you know three step system that goes to confer this actin binding capacity onto the onto the onto a molecule in question so the creation of this specific pip domain the ability of the transmembrane protein to recruit this ezrin molecule through a protein-protein interaction and then the actin binding domain of ezrin itself recruiting actin to the system so so there is you know i mean again a logic that is being revealed here uh, which we are actually now trying to recapitulate actually in some in vitro systems <clears throat> so thank you sir for this wonderful talk and we are really grateful to have you as a uh, is a speaker in our biophysical meet so uh, thank you very much sir thank now, you so much yeah thank you sir